Carmen Nunez, on behalf of Talks at Google, Hola Bay Area Chapter in the Hispanic Heritage Month, we welcome you and thank you so much for being here as well as everyone in the audience. Um, we're very honored to have a phenomenal, thank you. brilliant I am, author. I'm honored to be here. <laughs> oh, thank you. And give uh, Isabella a round of applause. Thank, thank you. Very excited to have you here. So, for all the people in the audience and those who are live streaming in, a little bit about you, Isabel. You've written 23 books and it's been translated into 35 languages. You've, your words have literally reached across all ends of the earth and um, have been adapted into movies and ballets and plays. Um, and we're just very excited to see what more you have in store for us. Uh, you've received the highest civilian honor, the Medal of Freedom, by former President Barack Obama. You've actually carried the torch in the Olympics, in the Winter Olympics. That was a fluke. <laughs> that was yeah, a fluke. That was. <laughs> And I have uh, never done any sports in my life, <laughs> nothing. I can't even walk. And I had to carry the flag on the Olympics. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> we, we were happy to have you represent um, Thank you. Latin America and women all over the world in that. Um, you've received a lot of honor, awards and um, honorary doctorates from universities. Um, very, very successful women. For someone who hi hardly finished high school, all those honorary degrees seem very <laughs> ironic. <laughs> yeah. So it's to say that we shouldn't have gone to high school. We. <laughs> but um, no, we're, we're absolutely thrilled about all the works that you've given us to the world. Um, and you continue to give back. You give yourself back to, with your, the Isabel Allende Foundation that empowers women and girls in all throughout Chile and California. And we're amazed by the words that you have for us and the actions that you continue to give. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I think we'd like to start with, um, we're from the beginning, from like how you became the person you became, someone born, a, a girl born in Peru, a Chilean girl born in Peru, um, and came here and had stories of love and mystery and coincidences. <laughs> Can you tell us a little well, bit about um, that? I wasn't planning to be a writer, really. I was born in the middle of the Second World, World War. Uh, in a very conservative, uh, Catholic, patriarchal environment. And I was supposed to be somebody's wife and somebody's mother. It didn't work out for me. I didn't have the raw material for that job. <laughs> I, uh, no, not at all. So I was very rebellious. Even when I was very young, I sort of realized that being a woman was not to my advantage because I saw my mom. I saw that my mom in the household where we lived we lived with my grandfather and my uncles. The males had all the privileges, and the w my mother, who was the only woman, didn't. And she didn't have any money, and she didn't have any independence. I didn't want to be like her. So I think I became a feminist around age five, <laughs> before the word was invented in Chile. And then um, I became a journalist in Chile, worked as a journalist. I did everything except radio. I did television, newspapers, magazines, you name it. And then we had a military coup in Chile in 1973. And very soon, I had to get out of my country. And I went as a political refugee to Venezuela, where I could not find a job as a journalist. So I worked in all kinds of odd jobs to make a living and support my kids, two kids and at least one dog. <laughs> and, um, and then uh, by 1981, I was working administering a school in, in Caracas. <laughs> that was not the job for me. I can't even add or subtract. And I had to deal with checkbooks and with money. And it was just a total disaster. But they kept <laughs> me for like four years. And during that time, in 1981, I got a phone call that my um, grandfather, whom I adored, was dying. And I could not return to my country to bid him farewell. So I, um, I started a letter, which was like a spiritual letter. I would write to him often. But this was a different letter, because I wasn't sure that if he was going to be able to read it. And I wanted to tell him that all the stories that he had told me, and he was a wonderful storyteller, I remembered them. I had them all with me. It was my. It, they represented my background, my roots, my family, everything that I had left behind. And I think that, in, in a way, as a political refugee, I felt uh, an overwhelming nostalgia. You, you sort of idealize the country that you left. There's a reason why you left, because you couldn't live there. But still, 
One idealizes it, and the idea is to try to go back all the time. So um, the letter that for my grandfather was about the stories that he had told me. And the first story was the story of my Aunt Rosa. My, my great Aunt Rosa was my grandfather's first fiancée. And she died in mysterious circumstances before they could get married. So eight years later, he married the youngest daughter in the same family with the idea that if he had been accepted once, he would be accepted the second time, too. So that's why he married my grandmother, whom nobody wanted to marry because she was so weird. She was, <laughs> she was adorable, but totally weird. She, she lived in another world. She was always experimenting with the paranormal. So my first few years were with this wonderful grandmother. And uh, there was a, a table, a very heavy Spanish table, where my grandmother would have the seances. And she would call the spirits with the table. And they say that the table would jump twice for yes, one for no. I have the table in my house. I've tried everything. <laughs> and you need two men to move the table. So I don't know how she did it, but there must have been some trick there. So with that background, with that family, I think that it was only natural uh, that I would have to write about it, mm -hmm. about that grandmother who is Clara del Valle in The House of the Spirits, my first mm -hmm. novel. So m the idea was to tell my grandfather that I remembered what he had told me. And the first story in the letter was the story of my aunt Rosa, my great aunt Rosa. And then I kept on writing. He died, and I couldn't stop. And it was the memories of the family, things that I invented, that I made up, and the history of my country for 70 years. So it was the micro world of the family that reflected the macro world of the country. Mm -hmm. And so that's the House of the Spirits. Of course, I didn't plan it that way. It just happened. Later, this book was written 35 years ago. And now that the book has been studied and whatever, people tell me all this mm -hmm. I, because I didn't plan it. So if you ask me what the book is about, I'm telling you what the reviewers have said, <laughs> not what I had in mind. So knowing now the reach that that book has had, would you have done anything differently? Would you have? Well, you know, I was, we were talking in the car that I never read my books because there's so much that you can correct. You can correct forever. Mm. Also, what was OK at the time is totally politically incorrect today. There are certain terms and certain things that you can say today, not even in Chile. In Chile, we have very little idea of what politically correct is. <laughs> in Venezuela, even less. <laughs> but, uh, but still. There are things that you don't say anymore in this century that we are living today. Mm -hmm. Too bad, because they were very colorful, actually. Do you think, <laughs> do you think that the Spanish language um, has morphed the way that you think in terms of femininity and masculinity? And as that's being translated to these other books, is there anything that's lost in translation? Well, in, as, as we all know, in the Spanish language, you cannot change Every, every, every adjective has gen gender because it applies to a noun that has gender, mm -hmm. which doesn't happen in English. So for example, I have a granddaughter who is into the LGBT, etc., and she, um, she has asked me to change the pronouns. In English, being a, the second language for me, it's pretty hard. But you, to translate that into Spanish is almost impossible, because every adjective would have gender. Mm -hmm. And so I, I can't handle it in Spanish that well. In that sense, it's a very different language. The other thing with, with Spanish also is that it, le it is a less flexible language than English. In English, everything can be turned into a verb. You can add other words. You can put words together in wonderful ways. Spanish is very strict. So you have to, to stick to grammar and, and, and spelling, of course. Mm -hmm. And you've been called the most widely read Spanish language author. Um, and you have Garcia Marquez and Jose um, and so many other amazing authors. Now that you see your name among those, does it change the way you approach new books and new stories? No, it doesn't, because I try to write from the womb, mm -hmm. not from the, from the brain so much. <laughs> and I try to write the best I can, whatever 
the critics say or how many books are sold or if they are compared to somebody else's writing, I can't worry about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't even read the reviews because I get either, I would say I get influenced. Mm -hmm. I don't get upset because I understand that if you do anything in public, well, people will criticize you. Some people will like you and some people will not. Mm -hmm. And I have to be ready for that. Mm -hmm. So I don't get all uh, upset because something is bad. And I don't celebrate too much when something is good because everything passes. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. In the long run, nothing, nothing matters. And out of all these authors like Jose Donoso and, and Garcia Marquez, was there any any one author that influenced you and that you looked up to? I was in my late teens, early 20s, when I started reading the big names of the boom of Latin American literature. At least 25 all male, many of them with mustache males, <laughs> who wrote these fantastic books. They were different books in different countries of Latin America, but all of them was, formed a, a sort of harmonic choir of that, that in, a, in a way told the world what Latin America was about and told us who, who we were mm -hmm. as, a, as a whole. So I grew up reading them. Yes. And did you ever know, you know, being them male authors, was there anything about you that you wanted to share differently that would impact Latino literature? I didn't plan it. I didn't mm -hmm. think that way. I just wrote what I knew. And I had been working for women and with women and being a woman all my life. So, so it was only natural that my protagonist would tend to be more female mm -hmm. than male. Uh, so when, when my book, The House of the Spirits, was published, they said that I was the only female voice in the boom. And then they rapidly said, no, she doesn't belong to the boom. She's post-boom. They didn't want a mm. female in the boom, of course. <laughs> so, um, so I'm post-boom, whatever. Post -boom. Post -boom. <laughs> and um, I never compared my writing to what they wrote. Mm -hmm. Other people did, but yeah. I don't. Mm -hmm. Your writing was definitely influential to, to many other authors after this what post. What they say is that, that because my book was so successful, the, even from the, from the start, publishers all over, not only in Spain, but all over, realized that mm -hmm. there is um, a readership, a feminine readership that wants to read female voices. So there was a market for, for, for female authors that before they had not maybe noticed. Yeah. And so in a way, that book opened the door for other women to be published. Mm -hmm. and, and I feel very proud of that. That's wonderful. Yeah. And within these books, you have powerful women, powerful women. Are these women? Um, portrayed and in, from real life people in your life? Do you know any weak women? <laughs> I do not. <laughs> yeah, you do not. Okay, good. <laughs> no, I just pick up people in the street and, I, and, and people, women that I know through the foundation, extraordinary mm -hmm. wo women who are survivors of sometimes the most horrible trauma. And they not only survive, they become leaders in their communities. Mm -hmm. So that kind of, of person, if a woman or man, is always fascinating. Yeah. And, and I'm always attracted to those people who, are, who stand outside the big umbrella of the establishment. Mm -hmm. Immigrants, refugees, uh, people who have uh, other gender choices, people who are, come from different races, from different ages. I've been writing a lot about very old people. And some readers say, why do you write about these people who don't even read because they can't even read? No, I, I'm interested always in, in, in what is outside, yes. not the mainstream. Mm -hmm. So including these diverse characters, o of course, it, there's a part of magic to it. The magic's not normal. You don't see that every day. And these... Well, let's, let's, no, the, yeah. <laughs> what's, what's magic so, to you? Magic to me, or I guess the way I was, I was phrasing it is, you know, the, fire and the poof and the, you know, out there, but, but the magic that you see and that I read in your books is natural, is in the, well, what in I, the real what world. I, what I understand is that 
we know nothing. Maybe you mm -hmm. here, here in Google, you know more, but, but normal people, <laughs> normal people know very little. Mm -hmm. And normal people have very little control over their lives. Yeah. And everything that stands outside that control, that explanation of life, is mysterious. Mm -hmm. And some, in some cultures, like America and many pla places in Europe, what you, don't, what you cannot explain, what you cannot control, and what you cannot sell, you ignore. Mm -hmm. It's not in the realm of reality. However, in most of the world, and I would say all of Latin America, all of Africa, all of Asia, we understand that there are dimensions of reality that we don't control and we don't understand, but we accept them. For example, in everybody's lives, there are coincidences. Those moments in which you, you think, I have been here before, and you, I know this place, and you know that you have never been there, but somehow it's familiar. Or a person that you meet, and you have the idea that you've met that person before. Or I am thinking of someone, and the phone rings, and it's mm -hmm. that person. That kind of, or, or dreams, that kind of thing that happens in everybody's life, you all ignore it, because you don't need it. But, but in my life, in my country, in my culture, you use it. You use it in everyday life. It, it becomes part of, it's integrated to life. For example, my, my mom died two weeks ago. And she, she was wonderful, and we had a very close relationship. And she would write to me every single day. And I wrote to her every day for 40 years or more. So I have 40 years of letters in boxes. And every box has between 600 and 800 letters. So multiply by 40, I can't multiply, but you can Google it. And it's, <laughs> it's a lot. And now that she's gone, I thought, well, why can't I write to her? Maybe she cannot write to me anymore, but I can write to her. Why not? Mm -hmm. And so then I've started writing to her and establishing a connection that is perfectly natural to me. And I know that, that if I write about it in a novel, it would be either crazy or magic realism. It's just life. So do you like when people say that your work is part of magic realism? I, I think that my work is very realistic. Mm -hmm. It just accepts what is mysterious, but it's very realistic. Mm -hmm. You know, Garcia Marquez, the master of magic realism, mm -hmm. explains it very, very wonderfully. He says uh, that in, in his book, 100 Years of Solitude, he has Remedios, La Bella, who uh, rises to heaven in, in, in body and soul. The, the original story is that in the village where he lived, in the town where he lived, a girl, had got, a girl got pregnant. And the family made her disappear. She sent her, sent her away. And the explanation the family gave was she ro rose to heaven in, in soul and, and body, right. like the Virgin Mary. And nobody asked more questions, because everybody understood that no questions were accepted. But when he wrote that in the book, it didn't, it, it, it didn't work. Mm -hmm. And he said he wrote it several times, and it never worked, until he had her hanging the sheets to dry. And a wind came and lifted her with the sheets. And then there is sort of explanation, you know? Mm -hmm. It's a parachute that elevated her. With the sheets is magic realism. Without the sheets is fantasy, like Harry Potter. Isn't interesting. it interesting? Yes, it is interesting. And it's <clears throat> interesting to hear that magic realism within the Latino literature is almost easier to understand because we have you know, spirits and, and we believe in. Um, but we have spirits here, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, all my friends see psychics. They hang crystals here. They, they see the hor horoscope. Everybody has a sign, I mean, a yeah. zodiac sign or whatever. So what's the difference? Yeah, it has a different true. name. Yeah, it's interesting. And do you? Do you speak to them about that? Like, do you connect those spirits into the, into the Latino community? Meaning, for those that go to psychics and um, they speak. Well, like, we go to psychics mm -hmm. too. Oh, yeah. that's true. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is there a way that um, you use this to impact um, Latino literature, or not Latino literature, but literature globally? Like this idea of, of everybody believes in the same things. Well, Let you me know show what? You. They are wonderful literary devices. Mm -hmm. When you can't solve something, you, you introduce a psychic. 
uh, and it's wonderful. <laughs> the only time that it didn't work for me, I was writing um, uh, a crime novel. Mm -hmm. And in a crime novel, everything needs to fit. So I couldn't introduce the astronomer or the psychic, unfortunately. <laughs> Astrologer. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm curious, because you've had a lot of impact in not just Latino literature, global literature, in representing the Latino culture, in Chilean culture, and history. How do you see that this is impacting others in seeing you know, Chilean history in books and those? I don't know if, how in, it impacts others, but, but um, I hope it does. Mm -hmm. Because I try to, I have written several historical novels, and uh, well, when you write fiction, you have more freedom, of course, and that, that's wonderful. But I try to present an event, a historical event, from the perspective, from another eye, not mm -hmm. the perspective of the winners. For example, I have a novel, uh, um, uh, novel called Island Beneath the Sea, and it is about the slave revolt in Haiti. And of course, all the history books were written by white men. French or American mm -hmm. or whatever. The winners. The winners mm -hmm. always. We never have the perspective of, the, of the, the poor people, the slaves, the people of color, the children, the people who really experienced the, the, mm -hmm. the event. So that's where I try to stand as a writer and as an observer. Mm -hmm. When I research for, for a historical novel, I go to, if possible, to private documents. Because if I read the history books, that's the official history. Mm -hmm. And I want the other history. The stories, what people yeah. were saying in their letters. I have a, a novel about the gold rush. We all know the gold rush because we've read about it here, written by the 49ers or the people who followed the 49ers. But long before the 49ers arrived, people of color were here. Yeah. Native Americans, Mexicans, Peruvians, Chileans. We were all in the mines before. And that, those voices have been obliterated. They don't exist. Mm -hmm. And the women who came also, they don't exist. Yes. So in that, for that book, I went to the library in Chile to research letters that Chilean miners wrote to their families in Chile in 1850. So, uh, I got a perspective from, from another angle that we never hear in the United States. Yeah. That's interesting to hear the letters, the stories. The stories. The stories the of person, these in, in a letter, for example, someone can explain that um, a, a, a bottle of champagne was cheaper than a glass of milk. You never see that in a history mm -hmm. book. And the reason is that there was no one to milk the cows. They were all looking for gold. <laughs> and, and champagne came in ships from France, so that was available. Interesting. So here at Google, um, similar to you being a storyteller and expanding the story's reach to people around the globe, we write code <laughs> and we make products and try to make these products accessible to the world. How do you see Google being, or you know yourself, in reaching out to these greater audiences with stories that have these little details that aren't communicated in other ways. I love the, the process of building a universe of details. Mm -hmm. the, it, it's in the details that you get the, the setting, the, the, the theater where the characters will move. And the more details I can find to make it believable, then the better that the reader will believe the unbelievable, yeah. which is the, the fiction. Mm -hmm. So I create fictional characters that move in a real world. And that makes it more believable mm -hmm. for the reader. Now, how that reaches other cultures, I don't know. But I love when I read a book, for example, written by an Indian author. And I can see how life is in India for, for that group of people and learn about them, it's, I find it fascinating. Mm -hmm. And do these stories impact your stories? Stories from all over the world, I mean, you don't, you, you're. Yeah, mm -hmm. my latest book, um, what's the name? <laughs> what's the name of the last one? Your latest book? Yeah, I forgot, Lori. In the midst of in, winter, sorry, because This I is a memoir, right? No, it's or not. The, the, my la my <coughs> latest book is fiction, and I forgot oh, the okay. name because I write in Spanish. Oh. <laughs> and I remember everything in Spanish, I can't remember anything in English. And um, in that book, I have a character that is a Guatemalan undocumented migrant. She's mm -hmm. a refugee. 
and she's running away from the gangs in her country, mm -hmm. that they have exterminated her family. I didn't have to invent that character. Mm -hmm. I had to reconstruct her world. But that character, we have cases like that in my foundation. We work with refugees. And, and a story like that, I don't have to, to create the story. I just have to recreate the village, the house, the grandmother, the food, the market, the, the voyage, traveling all the way from Guatemala across Mexico to come to the United States, the border, living in clandestinity in the United States undocumented. That's the world I need to construct. Mm -hmm. Very carefully and, and sticking to the truth. Because if I can be very believable in, in that aspect, then the character of Evelyn Ortega will emerge as real. Mm -hmm. And in sharing these stories of, of other people, and you have memoirs of, of your own life, um, Paola, and, and a recent one, is there a difference in you, the way you go about writing other stories versus your own story? Yeah. Uh, when I write a memoir, I'm not writing about me alone. Mm -hmm. I write about me and the people who are around me, my family, friends. And I ask myself, is this my story to tell? Am I betraying someone? Mm -hmm. If I have to choose between betraying my mother or telling the story, I tell the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't, I can't <laughs> resist it. I tell the story. But I understand that, that there is a limit to how much. You, so my, my way of handling it when I write a memoir, first, the problem is I write in Spanish. But once it's translated, or I have a, a sort of idea, I, I show it to the people who are named by name in the book. Mm -hmm. And if they don't approve, I take them out. I don't change it, but I take, it, take them out. It has happened only once. And I, in, with the latest memoir that I wrote a long time ago, I promised my son that I would never write another one. And I have so much has happened since then. Mm -hmm. I have so much to tell. <laughs> and I can't because I promised Nico I wouldn't. Mm. And <laughs> <laughs> um, so you have your family here, your, um, your son. Having your family near and, and having your mother be a, a huge inspiration, does that come across very well in the love that like Latinos usually, you know, a very communalistic uh, community? And, yeah, and but I don't have the extended family, you know. Mm -hmm. I've tried to uh, put together an extended family, and it worked for a while when my grandchildren were little. We sort of adopted friends with their children that were part of this almost compound where we lived. and. Uh, Kids would come to the pool. It would be an open house, a, a, always open house. Mm -hmm. And I had the feeling that I belonged in that little tribe where we all belong in Latin America. But now all that is gone. The, the grandchildren are older. They have gone to college. They finished college. They have their own lives. They don't remember me at all. Mm -hmm. You can adopt me. Yeah. <laughs> OK, <I'll be> <laughs> you are adopted. <laughs> yeah, good. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, like you're saying, uh, a lot of us have immigrated over, and there's been a consistent, or the Bureau um, of Consensus, just recently in the 70s and 80s, started using the term Hispanic Latino. Um, and we've been here long before then. So, <laughs> in, in, but we're still kind of creating our identity within the United States. How do you oh, see? Oh, I think it's, very, it's created already. Yes. We are not and so, how do you see you know, us showing to the world that, you know, we've been here long before any, anyone else? And you know, I don't think it matters. Mm -hmm. I don't think it matters who came first, mm -hmm. because we all came from somewhere else. Yeah. Except Native Americans, every single person who lives in this country has some ancestor that comes from another place. Mm -hmm. So who came first and who came second is not that important. I think that what is important is that how we uh, sort of blend into the culture without losing our identity, and we contribute or not to what this community is, this large country made of so many different colors and voices. Mm -hmm. So it is the diversity that makes the United States so, so powerful mm -hmm. and so unique. It's a country uh, created on an idea. Most countries emerge historically out of circumstances, geography, um, tribes that get together or not, la language that is mm -hmm. common. But the United States was created with an idea. 
And, and the idea of the founding fathers was very clear. And it's a country that with those ideas has been um, so powerful and so, so important in the world. And we tend to forget what made this country so extraordinary, mm -hmm. the ideas, the values, the principles in which the country was built, and the people who came from all over the world. All that is so important to keep going, to keep being what we are. Yeah, that's inspirational, and, and we're very excited to continue to build and show the world our identity from these, you know, the American dream of coming here. Um, and yeah, but the American dream is not white supremacy. Mm -mm. It is diversity. No. It is all of us, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I have one funny question that since we're here at Google. There are no indiscreet <laughs> questions, only indiscreet <laughs> answers. Have you, um, have you ever Googled yourself? And no. No? Never Googled yourself? I hadn't <laughs> thought about it. Well, interesting. Maybe we should try to Google I hadn't thought and of, see. However, <laughs> however, I did Google a guy. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's the only time I've Googled anybody. <laughs> I was, um, I, I separated from my husband after 28 years of marriage, and in good terms, it wasn't something awful at all. But I was in a sort of dark mood because I was 73 years old and I thought the rest of my life I'll be alone, mm -hmm. sleeping alone with my dog, not nice. <laughs> not that my dog is not <laughs> nice. No, no, my dog is nice. And, um, and then a guy out of the blue started emailing me. And there are a few stalkers, but not many. As you get older, the stalkers diminish <laughs> in number. And, um, and so he started emailing me, and then I Googled him. But I had a wonderful assistant, Chandra, who was like, like Sherlock Holmes in Google. <laughs> she could get in Google and get, I mean, the brand of his underwear, everything, <laughs> everything. So by the time I met the guy five months later, I knew absolutely everything about his life, his family, his kids, his, the, his car, everything. Wow, so Google, Google has a, a big power. That's the only time that I have used Google for that. <laughs> so. Well, thank you so much. I think at this time, we'd love to open up the, um, that would be great. the floor to questions from the audience. And we'll have to Google yourself and sometimes see what okay, comes up. Okay, we'll do that. Yeah. <laughs> it's always interesting and sometimes flattering. Or I'm sure with you often. I'm sure it's not flattering. <laughs> when you start seeing your pictures, it's not flattering. <laughs> yes. Hi, my name's Monica. Hola, and Monica. Hola. <laughs> um, you use the word blend in an interesting way. Um, blend to sort of blend culturally so that... Um, we're, you know, we're seen for who we are and how we are. The way that, that I've experienced blending as a Latina and trying to fit in is in contrast to how you described it. And I'd like to know, have you had experiences of trying to blend that have been at compromise or at odds to who you are? Well, um, I, sometimes I, I, I'm asked to speak to Latino youth mostly, who feel, who have either come recently or they descend from uh, Latino parents who speak Spanish at home, so it's a very Latino culture at home. And they feel outside, like outsiders, they feel that they are not the blonde kid with blue eyes that is popular in, at school. And I keep telling them, you don't have to let go of anything, you can have everything. You can have your culture, your language, your food, your music, and you can still have everything that this country offers. Why compromise for less? You can have everything. And, and keep what is your, your roots and makes you different and special and richer. I, but because I speak two languages, I feel that I have two different visions of the mm. world. When I uh, read my books in translation, because I have to check the translation into English, I realize that it is, that, that language is like blood, so personal. Mm. It comes with your upbringing, with your DNA. So keep it, mm. don't, don't forget it, and just incorporate more and more, and it becomes a richer life. And, I, and when I say blend, it doesn't mean that you Th th that you f forget or renounce to who you are, not at all. Thank you. 
Hi, uh, my name is Marisabel. Um, ah, hola. <laughs> hola. Uh, and yeah, thank you so much for, for your talk. And um, several times you brought up letters, like, uh, you know, how you, you've written to your mom and, and how you've researched uh, people's yeah. letters from so long ago. Um, and uh, I, I worked in Gmail for a while here, so, uh, you know, a lot of data privacy <laughs> things go through my head uh, uh, about people's letters. But my question is about, you know, now that you have a foundation um, and, you're, and you're working with some of these groups that each person has some stories that, that they are important to, um, to our history, right? Um, how can we, like, empower those voices? Um, you know, do you, in your foundation, tell these people, like, uh, you know, even though this is something difficult, like we have to write some letters, we have to um, make a way so that these voices are heard, you know, 100 years from now, 200 years from now? Well, there is a program in the United States, Tell Your Story, in which they record people. They record uh, migrants, people who, who come here from all over the world, and they go into a li this little cabin in which they record their, their story. And all those stories are being kept somewhere and archived. So, and, and now with all the media that we have, with all the incredible, the fact that everybody's taking selfies and, and YouTubes and everybody's in social media, this is a huge way of recording what would before would be lost without the letters. You know, the, I think that there are three photographs of me when I was a child. No one was taking pictures. To take a picture was a major thing. Today you take a picture of a hamburger, for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> and, and everything is recorded. We have a baby that was born in the family, and the mother, every single day, sends out at least two or three pictures of the baby. <laughs> I mean, I know the baby's butt by heart. <laughs> uh, that was impossible before. So I think we, we don't have to worry about that. The voices are being recorded, better than ever. Uh, hi. So actually, um, my question is the kind of a continuation of what you were saying. Is that um, you know when everyone's taking a picture and everyone's uh, writing stuff and and making movies, uh, then it all gets lost. So uh, what it is that you know a piece of technology, the printing printing press, 500 years ago made literature such an important part of society, and now technology is making it disappear because. Uh, you know, the attention spans are under two minutes. We read more than ever before, but only, you know, half sentences or 140 characters. What are your take on where it's going in the future? You know, I'm very optimistic about the future. Um, I don't think that technology will, um, will destroy culture. I, I think it contributes and it creates a new form of culture. Uh, I, and I think that very soon we will start filtering more the information we get because we are overwhelmed with, with trivia. And more and more our brain gets over, overloaded with things that are not really important. So we will learn to handle that. It's a, it's a, we are in a process of change. Our brains are, have changed. Our children are born different. When I see a three-year-old working in a computer, I mean, playing games, and I can't even turn it on. It's, it's interesting how, how humanity adapts to mm -hmm. new forms, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'm very optimistic. I don't think that the stories will be lost or literature will disappear. We, we all need to hear stories as part of our human, uh, human heritage, mm -hmm. like music. We need it. Yeah. And you can say it's more accessible now because of the internet. Um, you can get ebooks and yeah. have them yeah. on you at any time of the day. I travel with 20 books in my iPad. Mm -hmm. It's great. Okay. Hi, I'm Marcos. Hola, I'm very Marcos. glad to meet you. Hola, hola, que tal? Uh, I have lots of questions, but. Uh, no, one. <laughs> one, yeah, I know. <laughs> you were saying that uh, when you uh, write about a specific person, a real person, um, usually go and ask them what, what happens with a uh, big uh, characters like uh, uh, Neruda and Salvador Allende that you They're wrote dead. about. Huh? They're all dead. I know, I know. Yeah. But what I mean is, uh, do, you, uh, do you try to, to paint yourself on their, on their shoes and try to imagine what would they think about the way you well, wrote I, them? I have never written about someone that, I mean, some, someone like Neruda, while 
that person is still alive and trying to create a fictional character out of them. I don't do that. If, I, if I'm writing about someone who really exists, I stick to the, to the person, whatever the person has said. I would, I would quote that person, but not invent something that that person said, because it, it would be so easy to, to prove me wrong. Um, and I, when I, usually my, my historical books are from the far past. It could be 200 years ago, 100 years ago. I have um, a book about the conquest of Chile 500 years ago. But if I have someone who, now I'm writing a book in which one of the characters is still alive. He's 103 years old. And he's my friend. And when I, I, I don't, I used him for the book as a character, but not with his name. And I have used the information that he has given me as he gave it to me. I didn't make up anything about him. Because he's alive. He'll be dead by the time the book is published, <laughs> but, but still. Thank you. Out of respect, I mean. Hi. Um, some of the things I love about your books is how they transform me to a different time, especially in Latin America, being Latin American. Um, my question is, it's been a long time since you left Chile, and a lot has happened politically. What are the major changes you see when you get to go back there? Chile is another country from the country I left, but that has happened everywhere in the world. I mean, um, I left Chile 40 years ago, more than 40 years ago, in 1973. And um, I left a country that was under a dictatorship, living half the population living in terror, and the other half um, very happy with what was happening with the dictatorship because they were in control. And, and uh, 17 years later, that's how long the dictatorship lasted, I went back. And I found a country that still had, was, was a very cautious society. People didn't talk much at the time. Now everything has changed. But the, the, the fabric of the society had changed in those 17 years. Plus the world has also evolved, so Chile is another place. I go back with this romantic, nostalgic idea of the Chile I left, which was a poor, sober country that was struggling to find its, its way in the world. And I find a totally different society that is a neo-capitalist place that sort of doesn't fit my idea of Chile. But, but it's still Chile. People are the same. Mm -hmm. So I do have one last question. Um, are you writing another book? I am. I just finished it like, well, I will finish it tomorrow. Okay. Um, <laughs> I thought I had finished it last week, but no, I will finish it tomorrow. Um, because I write in Spanish, I don't have the possibility to share the writing with anybody. And uh, when the book is finished, I don't have anybody to show it to because my mom died mm -hmm. and she was the one who would read the book. And, and, but I showed it to my brother, and then I showed it to my former editor in Simon & Schuster, who speaks Spanish, but she left Simon & Schuster, so still I showed her the book. And so I'm getting their input, and by tomorrow, I should have a clean copy of the book. And the book is, a, a, I wouldn't say historical, because it's very recent, but it starts in 1936 in the Civil War in Spain. Mm -hmm. And it, it ends many years later. Mm -hmm. Well, we're very, really excited for that I'm book excited to come out too. We'll because every to book out. is like, a, like, you know, it's like, like a bottle, like, like a message in a bottle that you put in the sea and you never know what's going to happen. Yeah. If someone is going to pick it up, if it's going to be read by someone. <coughs> it's, I have written so many books and still I have that, that feeling of total uncertainty. Mm -hmm. But does it help that feeling? Because I feel like if you were... I don't know the other feeling, <laughs> so I, I don't know. Well, we're the very other feeling excited. Feeling great about it? I don't know that feeling. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're in the same boat here at Google. We're always aspiring to be great and perfect, but like, we're very excited to read I, the I'm next book. And inventing new things every day, yeah, which yeah. is how I feel about the writing, that every book, you have to invent everything again. 
And I try not to make the same mistakes that I've made before, but I make new ones. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's always new mistakes to make. That's always, that's comforting. <laughs> yeah, very comforting, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Isabel. Oh, it's been a truly you. an honor speaking with you. And thank I'm very you so excited much, we, we had you here to speak with everyone thank else Thank you very well. much. Thank you for coming.